The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Thank you for joining Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I am Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. Um, we have, uh, well, quite a bit to talk about, uh, as, as we do in most episodes here, uh, especially this time of the year. Bills are playing, Sabres are playing, Big Four basketball going on, uh, big matchup between uh, St. Bonaventure and UConn. A uh, great opportunity for the Bonnies to jump back into the uh, top 25 rankings because UConn uh, is in there. If they can uh, beat UConn, then uh, obviously uh, would uh, be significant. Um, Jonah, though, before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about last uh, episode in which we had Jerry Sullivan on. I have uh, something I, I want to mention from last week as well, last episode as well. Okay. Uh, well, I just wanted to bring, I thought the, that um, on social media, the discussion seemed to be pretty productive. I think that uh, people who listen to the podcast, uh, you know, Breon Harris uh, aside, uh, who just uh, noted how much I was coughing and uh, almost died while you well, passively watched and not I wanted up a phone. to uh, express some sympathy and, and <laughs> maybe apologize for uh, not acknowledging the, uh, coughing situation they were having but I would say I, at the time I thought when you hit mute and you were uh choking <laughs> on your lungs there that that was uh, me and Jerry had to carry the pot so I felt I, I better keep talking that's right make points that that was my well, mindset at that point the funny thing about it uh, from that is um and I left all those scenes in there but I do the for people who uh, watch the YouTube version of it I handle the camera angles and all that stuff and do the muting. I'm, so I'm, I do, you know, the minimal production that is uh, required to do this podcast and, and have it uh, transformed into a YouTube uh, episode. Um, so when I hit the mute button in my mind, I'm off the mic and I was off camera, but that's not the case. So I'm muted, but I'm still hacking into a napkin. Uh, I'm bending off, you know, like bending over <laughs> Uh, my head is off camera, but the rest of my body is in it as you know what I'm doing. Uh, so it took me a couple of, um, couple of those uh, coughing episodes before I realized I'm still on camera and uh, switched it over. So I did actually a lot more coughing. You also uh, muted, and, so I couldn't hear. Right. You might have been petting the dog or doing something else below your desk. That's a euphemism, uh, petting the dog. But uh, feeling a little bit better today. I think I'm going to make the trip to Tampa. Um, but we'll see how we get through this podcast. Um, but uh, back to uh, Jerry Sullivan's uh, appearance. I thought that uh, it was productive. I, I think I got a sense that uh, most of the reaction wasn't fuck Jerry Sullivan or XYZ, uh, anti Jerry Sullivan uh, sentiment. Uh, it was, hey, thanks for this. I didn't realize that that's how news conferences run. Uh, I didn't realize that Micah Hyde um, had gotten upset with Adam Benini before Jerry Sullivan. I didn't realize that such vernacular is used, uh, or not for vernacular, but vocabulary has been used in previous news conferences talking about embarrassments or frauds or soft and so anyways, uh, it seemed to be, it seemed to be good. Yeah. I didn't I don't see know what you comments. took from the social well, media. I, aspect I saw of. some of the comments and, and a few of them were, as you mentioned, people that said that maybe they disagreed with Jerry or didn't like the question and, and they changed their outlook a little bit after we talked about it a bit and let Jerry explain his thoughts and motivations and what his responsibility or the responsibility he feels when he's at the game, writing these columns. And it goes back to, I'm sure you've maybe dealt with this even more than I have, but everybody in my life, when they find out you, 
you work in the local media or with the Buffalo News at some point, brings up Jerry Sullivan and kind of asks, what's that Jerry Sullivan like? And they expect you to say that he's this, you know, mean-spirited character, because that, that's, I think, where he came across on certain radio, especially when he was on WGR in the past and in the press conferences and a little bit in his writing. But what I Isn't always that say Jerry is, Sullivan really as big of an asshole as he sure. as he as he appears to be. Exactly. Yeah, how many how many times have you been asked that question? A hundred. A lot. Yes. And, and what I always say is that no, he's um, he, he I think Jerry's a much more compassionate and thoughtful person than most of the public and most of the Bills fans and Sabres fans specifically uh, recognize. You can see it in a lot of his writing on other subjects when he writes about the local high schools and colleges and things like that, and some of the tributes to older players or, or people of deceased. And even Jerry opened up our show talking about Mark Pike and Larry Regan in that way on Wednesday. Um, and I was struck, cause I've never heard Jerry say this, that he gets nervous at these press conferences. Cause I thought that he kind of relishes in that role. And, and I think all of us maybe sometimes feel a little nervous when you have to ask a difficult question, but you kind of pull up your bootstraps and you do it. If you feel like uh, it's important or you have to, and I guess I'm repeating myself, but that's the one thing I'd emphasize that Jerry, none of us ask these questions because we want to be the center of attention. Maybe there are media people that do do that and try to make a name for themselves that way. But I think all of the people in this market on this beat um, that I've been around feel like they're doing their job or they're doing what uh, the fans maybe don't want, but need from us in, in those situations. And Jerry does it better than anybody. He's been doing it a really long time. He's been covering the Bills since 1989 and almost every home game and well, pretty much every home and away game since that period of time. And I think that for a lot of the armchair reaction to whether that was a good question or not, I think a lot of us should trust Jerry Sullivan's instincts because he's been in that press room with a lot of different players, a lot of different coaches, a lot of different teams and a lot of different circumstances. So if he felt that was the question that he needed to ask, I would defer to Jerry and believe that that was a relevant question. Yeah, and it's not the perfect analogy, probably, because it was the first analogy that popped into my head. But that's the reason I'm going to share it is because I guess naturally it did. It just popped in there. But Jerry talking about being nervous or anxious before he asks a question because he feels he has to because nobody else will. Uh, to me, is like when you learn that Rob Ray did not like to fight. Or, you know, various enforcers in the NHL, they didn't enjoy it. They did it because that was their job and nobody else was going to do it. And that's why they're there. And he's there to be the critic. Um, and you might not like it. That's not your cup of tea. But uh, if he doesn't ask that question, nobody else does or comes close to it. And you don't have the material and or insight uh, that was used and obviously consumed and became the story. And it, Jerry Sullivan wasn't the story. It was how they reacted to his question. Um, so, you know, I, I do find uh, the whole dynamic pretty interesting and on a much lesser degree, uh, people talk to me uh, because uh, I'm kind of known for my Rolodex and my sourcing and my ability to, to interview people. Um, and when I make the comment that I hate making phone calls. They're like, what, what do you mean you hate making phone calls? You do it all the time. I'm like, yeah, I do. But even picking up a phone and talking to somebody because you think you're going to intrude uh, and especially going back to the days before text and you're just doing cold calls on somebody and they don't know who you are, at least for the first few seconds. You, generally, these are famous people or celebrities, athletes, people whose first instinct is how did you get my number? Um, hey, I'm busy. I have things to do. Um, yeah, you generally, there's a chance that you could be told to go fuck yourself. <laughs> pretty high times, degree. And I don't enjoy. Do you, so, uh, what's that, Jonah? I was just going to say, how many times do you get nervous or have some apprehension to making that call? And then once that person picks up, they're more interested in talking to you than you might have been in calling them in the first place. Oh, it's, I, it's, I would say 99 times out of 100, it's an unfounded anxiety on my part because, yeah, and you feel so good after the phone call because it's over with, you learned a lot, you found out that they were, they like to talk. Um, you know, uh, I, guess, I guess maybe more so when I contact sources or people who, when I'm looking for somebody to confirm something to me and they are unwilling or they, they know who I am and what I'm up to. Uh, and they want nothing to do with me. They treat me like plutonium. Um, 
I get the hang up or, you know, that type of stuff. But yeah, usually it's an unfounded anxiety, but yeah, picking up the phone to call somebody is there's some unpleasant stuff out there, you know, that I've had to report on and to say, Hey, I just need to confirm this. I don't want to report it or be unfair. And I want to give you a chance to comment, you know, there's all that type of stuff. And people think that reporters get off on that stuff. And, and I hate it. I'll, I'll sit there and stare at the phone for a couple hours before I pick up the phone and, and intrude on somebody's life. Even if it's a feature story on, you know, whether kickoff returns are going away. Uh, you know, maybe I'm, I'm, I need to get in touch with, um, I don't know, Mel Gray or something. And, uh, you know, whatever the hell. Um, and I, I know I spend a lot of time sometimes wondering what the right time to call is and you waste half of the day right? waiting for that perfect hour to make the call. And once it happens, you kind of realize everybody has their cell phone in their pocket. And if they pick up, they probably have time to talk. And if they don't pick up, they weren't available at that time. You don't want to call them during dinner. Uh, I don't want to call them during, I'm constantly of a mind of what is this person doing right now that I'm going to be bothering them because I need to be ultra prepared for whatever reaction I'm going to get. And hopefully I'm, I'm, put at ease and, and they, they, they enjoy talking to me. Um, but anyways, that's much, much lesser degree, but yeah, there's a lot of anxiety in, in just being of asking questions of people. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there are some people who get through that, but I've always been a reporter who, and I know I've talked about this on the, the old radio show and on this podcast, like, especially in a locker room situation, I, I, I treat it as though I'm in their living room. Um, would I go walking into somebody's living room, um, a friend of mine even, and just think that I'm owed this time or I'm, oh, hey, uh, tell me you know, what's in that cabinet there? Uh, what's over here? Uh, tell me about this. Where did you, uh, how much did this cost? How much did it cost for you to do this ceiling? You know, it's none of your fucking business. Uh, but in sports, there's this attitude like we can just go walking into a locker room and we were owed uh, information. Uh, and I've never well, I felt do, that way. I do think there's a bit of a distinction in especially covering a game because that is part of the deal. It's in the contract. It's True. in whatever agreement and the social contract with everybody involved in playing and covering yeah. and watching the game that players are to comment and talk. And as I mentioned on Wednesday, I don't really perceive it as they're giving me the information and answering my personal questions. I believe it as I'm trying to be a conduit to the people that read the story or watch the clips and ask them and prompt players and coaches to give insight and explanation right. and inform what we write. That's the biggest thing is that whether you answer my question or respect my question or respect me, I'd rather you just give information that helps the stories and the coverage be more thorough and informative. But I do wonder, cause I saw some reaction, maybe specifically from Patty Thomas, Thurman Thomas's wife kind of saying that, you know, we shouldn't expect athletes to come out after they lose and answer these tough questions that, the game is so emotional and that it shouldn't be part of the responsibility. And while I would argue that the league and the players benefit from that as a whole, maybe not the players individually in that moment, but the league and the sport in general benefits from that open and consistent access. But what do you think? Do you, do you think we're as a whole are asking too much of professional athletes to kind of cut themselves open and, and share their emotions and insights so quickly after the game? Well, I think it lends itself to a lot of the things that we discussed uh, when Jerry was on and, and the current setup is it's almost designed uh, to produce what we had after the game on Monday, you know, a fiery confrontation uh, because we're not allowed to go into the locker room and, and spread our questioning around to different people and the bill's decision to keep giving us the same people over and over and over again. And there's the old saying that familiarity breeds contempt. And, you know, I think that, you know, they get tired of it and it was a tough loss. And I think that some different voices would help. It gives them a break. Um, it gives the reporters a different voice to put in their stories. Uh, we, I think it would be good for both sides. Um, how do you think Micah Hyde would have reacted if one of the reporters who is there every day and tends to ask a lot of soft questions about, you know, what would they ask about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or, you know, the Wednesday type stuff and right. 
would that have changed the way a player reacts if it was somebody who is known for asking a lot of easy questions, but you know, felt like after this game, they had to ask a tougher one. And asked it the same exact way that Jerry did? Uh, yes, asked the same question. Maybe with less bite, because Jerry does ask the questions in a very stinging way. And I do think that is maybe part of the problem. It was better in the past because Jerry was there five days a week and writing different types of columns. I think now the players and that team. A lot of these players don't know who Jerry is. But I think some of them understand who Jerry is a little bit and understand that when they see him, they expect those questions because he's not always there asking the other questions. Now, he used to be, but now he's not. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, maybe there'd have been a little bit more grace involved or not grace, uh, a little bit more latitude to somebody that they're more familiar with. Um, you know, Adam Benini, I don't know how often he's there during the week. Usually it's, you know, Ashley Holder has been there. And of course she's on maternity leave now. And uh, I think Julianne Pelusi has been out there at, you know, and I, I haven't myself been out there too much during the week over the last uh, couple of months because of, you know, my COVID and different things and working on these stadium stories about various circumstances. So I haven't been out there either, but at least they know me from, from years, you know, because, I, I was doing it pre-COVID and all that stuff, but. Um, yeah, I just know from. Yeah, my but Adam, I guess what I was getting at is like Adam Benini had, and I keep using that as like the barometer is it wasn't just Jerry. It was, let's remember that the very first question asked was from Adam Benini, who I think probably they, they know is a Sunday guy or a game game only guy. They don't, they don't get him through the week too much. Um, but yeah, they, they, snapped at him too, or Micah Hyde did anyway. So um, anyways, I, I think it, it's probably good for both sides. It's probably good reminder for the reporters that you do need to be more artful with the, with your questions and, um, and not just demand and um, demand a reaction more so than really a, a response. Uh, you know, that probably not the best, it was, it's not a way, it's a way to get, some kind of insight based on a, you know, body language or, you know, an angry response, but it wasn't the best way to get insight as to what went wrong and why the run defense had so much trouble and what the Patriots were doing. And, and maybe we weren't going to get that anyway out of Mike Hyde and, and Jordan Poyer in that moment because they were frustrated, but. Um, and maybe we should listen to what they said and how they answered it. I think a lot of the subtext there was that they weren't embarrassed because they felt like maybe the run defense wasn't as big of a problem as the sure. questions were implying. Agreed. Agreed. And I think that that was what was written about. And Because um, Rodak shared with us, um, I don't know, he has this like on permanent recall, but a few years back the Saints came in and, and had a big rushing day. I think they set some kind of record for uh, – yards rushed against the bills and they ran on 24 straight plays or something like that. And similar questions were asked to defensive players and Sean McDermott, and they reacted differently. They, they acknowledged that there was some embarrassment in getting beat that way. I think that game played out differently than the new England game, but it's interesting to, to note that. And as you said, even in this season, players have been asked similar questions and not taken as offense to it, but this game that night, you know, maybe because of the stakes of the game, the emotions were more raw, got a different response than players have given to similar questions in different situations. It was a thing on SportsCenter. You know, it was dissected by, by national broadcasters. Uh, it became a thing on social media on Tuesday morning where pundits from around North America – Canada a lot of reporters, and the United States, we're talking about it. But yeah, yeah, nobody's talking about a Bills Colts news conference on a Sunday when there's been a bunch of games and it's on in the afternoon uh, or, um, you know, Bills Jaguars. I mean, Pete, there's just too much to, 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 you know, it's everything is fractured uh, in terms of coverage. But on this one night, this one question gets this one response, which it was actually fairly common in these news conferences and now it becomes a story when probably shouldn't have been. And I think this has been going on for years, but the more these press conferences are carried live and everybody can see kind of how this process plays out. And there's a bit of a sloppiness to coming up with those questions on the spot and getting them worded right and 
gauging the player's mood and, and how they're going to react to a question that I don't think it's really fair for people to sit at home and watch press conferences. I see this a lot in the NBA with basketball and say, that was a stupid question. How can you let this reporter that has six Pulitzers ask a question like that? Where I think you really got to judge the media on what gets written and what gets broadcast later and, and how we do our actual work. And that some of how the sausage is made can be a little awkward. And there are back and forths like that. I don't think, I don't have a problem with the question. I don't have a problem with the response. I think some of the people on the outside that thought the question was out of line or the response was out of line, I would take more issue with them than I would with Jerry or Micah Hyde. Yeah, I recall uh, asking of Josh Allen after a game in New England, and I can't remember which one it was. I just remember that we were in the visitors news conference room there at Gillette Stadium. And I joined a little late uh, because I was over in the Bill Belichick, uh, Tom Brady news conference. I came over, uh, Josh had been going for five of his probably 10 minutes that he was going to talk. So he was halfway done. I needed to whisper around to the other reporters and PR. Has this question been asked? Has this question been asked? Because I don't want to duplicate or, but you know, so there's all kinds of like, you're, you're scrambling a little bit. And then I remember asking the question, the Bills had lost the game and I asked it poorly. And it was because I'm trying to do it on the fly and I'm adjusting based on what's already been asked, based on what he's saying. And I don't remember what the gist of my question was, but I made reference to having to prove himself or being like still establishing himself as an NFL quarterback. And I mentioned Wyoming for whatever reason. I don't, I don't remember. It was Jermaine, but. But at that time, again, you're talking about trigger words. We talked about that uh, with Jerry, things like fraud, quit, uh, embarrassing, uh, soft, um, tank. You know, there's all kinds of trigger words. But at that time for Josh Allen, bringing up college and the transition that he wasn't necessarily, that maybe he wasn't quite getting it yet as an NFL quarterback was a trigger. And as soon as that left my mouth, I thought to myself, shit, I just, I just, um, kneecapped my own question. And of course he took, he answered the question as politely as he could, but I could tell he took exception. And the next day, or I guess it would have been the, the following Wednesday at practice, I went up to him and I apologized. And he's like, Oh, you don't ever have to apologize to me. But that would, again, that was Josh Allen being diplomatic. And I explained to him why. And I said, sometimes I don't ask the question the right way. I didn't. And I got, I got to ask that question better. And, um, he was like, okay, but he was also kind of like, you know, football players don't view journalism necessarily as, an, as, as something super serious. Like we, in many ways, I think that the sports industry views the media as some sort, sort of lecherous um, thing that we make money off of them. Uh, like we're, we're um, barnacles on the bottom of their big ship type thing. And so me trying to apologize for a question, I think Josh Allen kind of at that time, I got the sense that he thought it was, you know, like, what's the big deal? You're just, a, you're just asking questions. Um, but then, but I also think that he realized that we do take this seriously, that we're not, you know, we're not just out there trying to get a rise. You know, some are, some certainly are. I mean, you can name some reporters in this town and I'm not talking about sports writers. I mean, you think of somebody like a Dave McKinley with the way he asks questions for channel two is definitely, you know, trying to, you know, uh, get a reaction. Uh, that, and I think that there's value in that too, uh, because you can be lulled into, um, yeah, I, I think that having Jerry Sullivan in that room is good. And I think it's because it's a variety. Uh, it's a different an approach. It's not my approach. It's not your approach. Um, you know, I, th I think that Jerry's missed uh, that he's not around more. Same thing with Bucky Gleason. And um, anyways, uh, I, well, I just wanted you know, to, well, we, we didn't talk much about, and it got a lot less attention was that Sean McDermott didn't like some of the questions coming his way. And I, he didn't really lash out, but you could tell that he didn't uh, appreciate the, some of the line of questioning specifically, you know, related to Bill Belichick and right. coaching matchup. And those questions were asked. I mean, they weren't um, as confrontational as Jerry's. I mean, the, those questions came mostly from Matthew Fairburn and, um, and Sean knows that Matthew covers the Patriots now. So he's got those wheels spinning in his head as he's trying to answer the question. Um, so, yeah, that was an interesting uh, exchange. 
And it made a lot of people's stories uh, in that, you know, the whole let's let's not give Bill Belichick too much credit here. Uh, so Matthew obviously asked some questions that got Sean McDermott out of his autopilot mode, which is kind of what you want to do as a reporter, not not to get somebody. It's not even a gotcha. It's like, let's try to get you out of this this track that you're on. You have things that you want to say before you even open that door to walk into the news conference coaches they come in with an agenda and sometimes they won't even they'll ignore your question and just say what they want to say uh to get out the to make the point that they want to make uh and it's our job to kind of get them in the, into a different frame of mind to hey okay let's actually think let's actually not just say hey we made adjustments at halftime i recall a- asking sean mcdermott a few weeks back i said okay well what actually is that process like in the locker room at halftime when you say make adjustments how do those adjustments get made? What's the discussion like? Who are you talking to? And he kind of gave me a little bit more insight into that without, I mean, he was kind of like, well, everything's different, you know, but still I like, let's, let's get an example. Let's get, let's follow up on this. Let's not just, sit, let's accept this, these phrases that we're so used to hearing from coaches. Let's actually delve into it to see what you mean. But when you say making an adjustment anyway, um, but you're right. And, and that's where Matthew's value came in. He got Sean McDermott to think in a different way rather than his bullet points that he had in his mind that he wanted to, to say going into that news conference. And Matthew was in there. I was in the Patriots interview room and Fairburn was in there for a while. I'm, I'm not sure what interview maybe he left and went over to the Bills. But and, you know, you take this with a grain of salt with the Patriots because they do this more than maybe anybody. But I got to genuine sense that the Patriots really did respect the Bills, that their defense and some of the comments Belichick made about uh, Josh Allen's arm and ability to throw in the wind. And I think that they thought the Bills could throw in this weather and maybe the Patriots couldn't. And the Patriots had to play this way. It was their only way to win. And they felt, I don't know about fortunate, but I think they felt like they were happy that they won this way and that the Bills were good enough to win this game, even with the brilliant game plan that Bill Belichick and his staff came up with. And I, I don't know. I think if you covered the Patriots locker room and then went to the Bills locker room, I would say you would have maybe more respect for the Bills than than I think some of the Bills fans and Bills media did just watching the game and then going right to the the Bills podium. Yeah. And then they have uh, Tom Brady uh, on Sunday at four 15 down in Tampa. I think that's uh another psychological game to have Belichick and Brady three out of four games, uh, the spills schedule at a time when, uh, you know, they obviously need to string wins together. Uh, this could be a situation where they lose back-to-back games for the first time this year, at least in Las Vegas, that's what they're expecting. Uh, Tampa Bay is a three and a half point favorite and to try to get some, uh, some picks from Joel Staniszewski. He's not going to be able to join uh, the podcast today, but uh, we're going to try to get him, uh, get some picks from him that I can announce here. Um, but uh, Tom Brady and Chris Godwin and healthy Gronk. Mike Evans, Rob Gronkowski, uh, G- uh, Leonard Fournette. Champion. I mean, a really a pretty good offensive line. I'm sorry, Joan. I stepped on you there a couple times. No, I, well, I was stepping on you, but Super Bowl champions. I mean, yeah, they're the Super Bowl champs with the reigning MVP. I mean, the the NFL yearbook, the record and fact book, comes out every year, and they put the NFL MVP on the cover every year. So, this is the you know the main reference book that I'm using all throughout the season. Every time I reach for it, here's Tom Brady yelling at me. Uh, that's because despite his age and despite him not being a Patriot anymore, he was the MVP and won the Super Bowl, and he's pretty friggin' good and all that stuff. And so you have the Bills without Tredavious White going up against uh, a team that can sling it. You know, Chris Godwin uh, is right around 900 yards already this year. Rob Gronkowski playing I'm, – I'm sorry, Godwin's at 950 with five touchdowns. Mike Evans – He's at uh, 800 yards with 10 touchdowns. Gronk, after missing a bunch of games, has six touchdowns still, uh, and he's playing well. Um, Leonard Fournette with a couple of receiving touchdowns on top of seven rushing touchdowns. So this is an offense that can get after it. Uh, They have uh, lost only three games this year, but they've lost um, to some, yeah, some middling opposition, uh, albeit all those games being on the road. They're, They're undefeated at home, but 
Uh, the three losses for uh, Tampa Bay this year, if you're curious, at the Rams, at the Saints, at football team. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, the Bills have a, have a puncher's chance in this game. Some people, including uh, Joe Biscali at the Athletic, uh, picking uh, the Bills uh, to win this game outright. Um, I don't see it that way. I, I think that uh, Dane Jackson is going to have his hands full with either Godwin or Evans, depending on how things shake out from a formation standpoint. Uh, Taron Johnson against Rob Gronkowski will be interesting, uh, or however that that also shakes out. Um, the Bills anyways, do uh, still have the number one rated pass defense in the NFL, which I guess when a team only throws three times against you, that helps with that. But they've been very good against the pass throughout the year. Even though the pass rush is, it's been there from a pressure standpoint, but not necessarily from a sack standpoint. But compared to last season, the Bills' defense as a whole and the pass defense has been better than it was. Now we don't know how much not having Tre'Davious White is going to affect that. It's a different weather challenge. It might be over 80 degrees down there in Tampa Bay, and on a short week and coming off the game and the weather that the Bills just played in, they have to turn around and play a much different style on defense. But I think it suits the Bills style and personnel and roster right now much better to be in this kind of shootout type game. Uh, it reminds me of, you know, back in the nineties, the bills would play the 49ers and, you know, even though they didn't have as much success winning. Are you predicting Bowl, no punts? I mean, it could be a game like that. I don't know if there's going to be no punts, but it might be a game that I don't know if the bills are, have a better chance of winning the Super Bowl than Tampa Bay does, but I think that they can compete against Tampa Bay in this game. Uh, maybe better than they could against some other teams and some other matchups. I uh, just got a text from Joel Staniszewski. Uh, you'll enjoy this. Uh, asked taking him for the bills, his... I bet. Well, uh, this may be one of the most insightful uh, decisions uh, from, or at least uh, predictions from Joel Staniszewski, who loves his bills. He says, uh, and I'm just going to read you the text. The bills are frauds. Ooh. I wouldn't bet them plus three with your money. He said, line should be at least five. I can't trust them to stop Brady because they never have. Clearly still bitter from last week. So that's clearly Tampa. Uh, he wants you to take Tampa and, uh, and go ahead and give the three points to the Bills. He didn't give me a total. Uh, but if I'm going to guess he would go take the over. I, I'm not sure what the total is. Um, I don't but anyway. know where, this, where did this idea come from that the Bills are fraudulent, that they're not what they claim to be. I think it was more. I think it's because they haven't been outsiders a... that put them on that pedestal. And I don't know if the bills came out and said, we're the best team in the league and we're going to win the super bowl. And we shouldn't lose any games to any teams for the rest of the season. 53 and a half is the total, by the way, uh, bills versus uh, Buccaneers. Um, no, I, Frauds. I mean, I don't think that the team itself has to say we're going to go win the Super Bowl to be considered a fraud. Uh, I think that Vegas had them as the favorite to win the Super Bowl just six, seven weeks ago after they beat the Kansas City Chiefs. And that was the last meaningful game that the that the Bills won. They haven't beat a team with a winning record. Um, any good team has has beaten them aside from Kansas City. So they're, after Kansas City, what's their best win? New Orleans? I mean, banged up New Orleans? Um, Miami? Uh, being able to sweep Miami, who is now making the in-the-hunt graphics, by the way. Um, why, I guess Washington. I guess Washington. Which being able to shut out Washington in week three. Washington's making a little bit of a run here, and, and uh, you know, that's a, that they are a big part of the – the conversation this week because uh, Washington playing arch rival Dallas Cowboys uh, with a chance to make up some ground in the NFC East. But um, I don't yeah, know. I, don't, I, I just think the teams that lose and underachieve, I don't know what's fraudulent about that. Um, I think that that maybe comes from outside expectations from the outside that this was a team that was going to, or a number one league. ranked defense after those back-to-back -back shutouts against Washington and Houston, and then doing a number on Kansas City. You know, the Bills' defense was ranked number one in terms of points against for a good chunk of the season, and now teams are touching them up. I mean, good teams anyway are kind of having their way with them. Yeah, I mean, I think they're the second-ranked defense now. They've been inconsistent, 
and they've underachieved and underperformed. And I think that there's issues with the roster makeup that makes certain matchups and certain styles of play that the other team brings running the ball and, and trying to stop the run that doesn't favor the bills. I, I, but I think that they're largely the same team they were last year performing, maybe not as well, but somewhat close, but there's different, every season's different. And, and this season has not gone as well for the bills. I, they had some fortunate breaks in the way the season developed last year and that nobody was really able to stop their passing attack. And now teams have figured out ways to stop their passing attack and force them to do something else. So I don't, I wouldn't, I would push back on anybody calling the bills frauds, but I do think that we're seeing that they have weaknesses that weren't as apparent last year. So I would say that maybe the real frauds were the analysts that said before the season that they were the best team in the league and they're a Super Bowl contender and a Super Bowl favorite. Well, what about uh, the idea of frauds being syn- uh, synonymous with being fooled? Like you fooled us, you know, and there are a lot of fans who were probably quietly because they didn't want to jinx anybody making plans for February 13th in Inglewood, California, uh, or, you know, uh, let's start saving up money for those home playoff games after we get that first round by and, you know, all, all this other stuff. Um, yeah, I think that there are a lot of fans out there that with the scars that you have in Western New York, PTSD, perhaps, that they're like, damn it, they fooled us again. I bought in after all those years and people were talking about them and I, I bought in and, you know, those analysts and I trusted, you know, Kyle yeah, Brandt to know what he, what, what he was talking about. And I would say it's a, my response to that would be that you only get fooled if you are a fool and that the bills are, they're not playing as well as they did last year and they're losing games. They need to play better, but they're trying to win the games and they have a reasonable amount of talent on the roster. I don't think, Frauds to me would be like when the Sabres thought they were a playoff team and they came in last place and they just really weren't anywhere near as competitive as they should have been. And the effort wasn't there and the coaching staff was over. What if the Bills don't make the playoffs? Would that make them frauds? I think they would make them disappointments, but not frauds. Unless they really stopped trying and the wheels really fell off. Um, you know, I, I think you might be able to say some of their statistical ranks are fraudulent because they maybe overinflate some games against backup quarterbacks. But I, I, ju- I just wouldn't call the Bills frauds. I wouldn't really subscribe to that kind of rhetoric. So sort of how I said with embarrassing the other day. That's a strong word that can be used, but it, I think it really needs to be used when, in certain ways. That not every team that tries to win a game and comes up short because the other team beat them should be embarrassed, and not every team that's trying to make the Super Bowl and maybe doesn't quite have what it takes is a fraud. Well, there's another school out there that maybe is flirting with the, uh, well, I said yeah, another but, school, I should say another team. Well, so St. Bonaventure, were they fraudulent top 25 team in the preseason? Cause now they're not in the top 25. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's where we're, we're playing with semantics, but they have a chance to get back into the top 25 tomorrow at four o'clock in Newark, in gorgeous Newark at the, uh, the Prudential Center, they're going to play UConn. UConn, eight and two so far this year. They are ranked number 15 in the AP poll. Uh, St. Bonaventure, not ranked at the moment, uh, but on the cusp. So I think a victory over UConn probably puts them in there. That would make them nine and one. Uh, the game's going to be on ESPN, too. Uh, maybe you want to go uh, to Amherst Pizza and Alehouse to check that out. Just a thought. Um, but, um, Jonah, your thoughts on this game, obviously Kyle Lofton's availability is going to be significant, but, um, Bonaventure has also been pretty good when, when they've been without him. They've been winning without him. I think they've missed him in certain ways and, you know, he's their best player and I don't know how much I like their chances of beating UConn without Kyle Lofton, but. I wouldn't lose all hope. You know, they have four other senior starters back from last year and guard play that they should be able to play and compete. But I just don't know. I think this is the biggest game on St. Bonaventure's schedule, probably the best team they're going to play all season on a neutral floor. 
And it's hard to expect the team to win a game like that without its best player, without its point guard, without its leader, as well as Bonner has kind of functioned offensively with Jaron Holmes playing point guard. But everybody's a little bit out of their normal role without Kyle Lofton. And so the, the Bonnies are not at their best without him. And I wonder if they can win this game not being at their best. UConn's also got some injured players that may be coming back, maybe not. That could factor into it. It's a neutral court, which – but it helps Bonaventure more than having to go to UConn and play. Uh, and uh, they've won three games on neutral floor already. Really their three best performances have come down at that Charleston classic against bigger teams on a neutral court. Um, whether they win or not, this is a big game. It's, it's the most crucial game on their schedule in terms of where they could end up being seated in the NCAA tournament and being a team on the, on the at-large bubble or, or you know, not on the bubble, playing their way into the tournament. A win like this would really go a long way towards that. Their next game is against Virginia Tech, which is a borderline top 25 team. So this is an opportunity if St. Bonaventure can win uh, to get back into the top 25 and establish themselves as a team that uh, could be seated, you know, five, six or seven or something like that when the tournament comes around. And if they don't win this game and they don't win at Virginia Tech, I think it really puts them in a position where they probably won't get back into that top 25 and, and high seed conversation unless they really make a run and almost run the table in the Atlantic 10. And as it relates to Kyle Lofton, um, Mark Schmidt said he's day to day. Kyle Lofton told a national reporter, Adam Zagoria, that he was going to try to play. I'm dubious if he will be able to play. Uh, from what I've seen, I don't think he's really back to practicing yet. It's been about two weeks and two days since he had what was reported as a high ankle sprain. That's usually a longer term injury. And even if he is going to try to play, I would question if he can come back and be a hundred percent and be the best version of himself. And he's a player who's got, you know, NBA potential at least to be, you know, in a training camp next year, he's going to be playing pro ball somewhere. The Bonnies need him to be healthy and at his best in February and March, not necessarily in December. So I do wonder, unless he's feeling wonderful, and if he was, I think he'd be practicing already, if he really should play and if he will play tomorrow. UConn is a four-point favorite, although that game is not on the board in most establishments, probably because of Kyle Lofton uh, and his status. But uh, you can find it uh, at a couple of places, uh, minus four, uh, and the total uh, 137.5 for those uh, educational needs. Uh, UConn coming off a loss to West Virginia at West Virginia. And uh, the only other loss on the record is against Michigan State, uh, which was in one of those uh, Bahamas classics uh, a few weeks ago. So, uh, but not a lot of huge wins uh, for UConn. I'm looking at it here. You know, they've played the usual smorgasbord of Central Connecticut, Coppin State, LIU, Binghamton. A uh, big win over Auburn, a 115 to 109 game. Um, but uh, Virginia Commonwealth, Maryland Eastern Shore, Grambling. Um, I don't know what uh, what there is to glean off of that uh, set of opponents, but uh, I'm anyways. looking at also the location. So they've played they played at West Virginia. They played most every other game at home, but they did have down at the Bahamas uh, three neutral court games, and they went two and one. Um, you know, if they, if they were coming off like Syracuse tends to do, where you play all your games at home early on, and this was their first neutral site game, I think that would favor St. Bonaventure. It does seem like they have uh, some experience going away from home and playing this season. There's also the coaching matchup. Dan Hurley was at Rhode Island previously, so he knows Mark Schmidt and his style very well. Mark Schmidt knows him and his coaching style very well. So I don't know if that helps either team, but uh, the Bonaventure won't. Uh, catch UConn by surprise in, in a way that maybe they, they could in another matchup. I would also say this is good scheduling for St. Bonaventure to get two neutral site games against power conference teams, really five. But an MTE is, is not – it was good that they got invited to that, but every team has an MTE and kind of has those opportunities. But now getting two more neutral site games against uh, big-time teams is a good way for them to build their NCAA tournament resume – and get some wins because sometimes when you go on the road in those environments, those games are very, very difficult to win. 
what else on the uh, big four roundup, Jonah, or the college circuit uh, before we go? Well, UB's got a big game tomorrow against St. John Fisher. We'll oh, come on. There in that one. I've been seeing that advertised. and uh... Yeah, I don't think that was – I think UB got stuck with their schedule. They had trouble getting a point. UB had a really good win the other night at Western Kentucky, and they have a good schedule in terms of some of the other games. UC Irvine is a good team they're bringing in next week. Um, they played at North Texas. That was a good game at Michigan, at Bonaventure. But they seem to – they were not able to get um, all of their home dates filled out the way they wanted to. I think Niagara has something to do with that. And they had to play Point Park, which I think they're an NAIA school, and now St. John Fisher. I don't think UB wanted to go into the season having to play these games or they would have preferred to maybe play them as exhibitions. Their exhibition against Damon got canceled. They had to play Madai in that game. I would have loved to see that Damon game rescheduled in a way and maybe you buy out St. Fisher. I don't know if that was possible. Damon plays a home conference game Sunday, so maybe that wasn't possible on this weekend. But, you know, I, I just think it's, it's, it's the way it is for UB. They, you know, they had to fill out their games, and this is what they were able to do. So UB, would ha- the way the MAC shapes up this year, you're going to have to win the MAC to get into the tournament. So it's not really a discussion about UB per se. But in situations like this, where a school plays a Division three opponent or NAIA, Division II, whatever, how much can that hurt a team when it comes to whether or not – when, when they're on the bubble as to whether or not they get in the tournament? Because – and I know that things are ranked and you still have the Ken Palm and all the different power rankings and the algorithms and the analytics, but isn't there still a kind of a, an awkwardness of, of just rep- – like, why are they playing the – why do well, we want to – there is. And I think it hurts maybe the fan experience a little bit. It skews some stats in certain ways. But for those type of rankings, in most cases, in Ken Palm and I think net, they don't count. If you don't play no, it. No, but what I'm saying is game. when the committee were to look at it and see St. John Fisher. Yeah, they just don't even look at it. Whereas if you beat They wouldn't team maybe like, even detra- detract from it and say, we're going to. It, it doesn't. I think less of the numbers. I think they just they throw it out because a lot of teams will play a lower division team in their first game of the year. Sometimes it's an exhibition, sometimes it's not. And that just kind of gets thrown out of the analysis. Whereas, uh, you know, Bonas ranks are being hurt a little bit from playing Canisius and Siena, who have very poor records, Coppin State. Some of the teams they beat uh, don't have good records. That hurts your strength of schedule. So in a way, playing St. John Fisher is better than playing. Beating St. John Fisher won't hurt you be in a way that beating Niagara – might not help right. the rank. But as you mentioned, UB is not going to be on that, in that at-large discussion. So it's really just about uh, winning games, building confidence, getting ready for the max season. I don't think playing lower division teams helps in that regard. So with the football team, they, they beat up on Wagner in week one. I don't think that prepared them very well to go to Nebraska the next week. Uh, UB has Canisius next week downtown. I believe that's the next game they're going to play after this one. Um, and I don't know if the St. John Fisher game is going to help or hurt them in that regard. UB has some health issues. Jonathan William missed the last game with a non-COVID illness, and they have some other injured players. So maybe getting this little break on the schedule helps them that way. Right. Um, so is UB uh, St. John Fisher uh, televised, Jonah? It's probably on ESPN+. Plus. I'd have to go look to be specific <laughs> about that. And this is a big game for St. John Fisher. I know at least one local player, Eric Kegler, that played at Canisius is there, uh, whether it's St. John Fisher or Madai. When these local teams do get the opportunity to play at UB in the big arena, it's a very memorable moment for everybody involved and something that they can use to recruit. So from that standpoint, it's a little bit good for local basketball that, that UB is willing to bring these teams in and play these type of games. Um, you know, Fredonia got to play at Canisius. They lost by 66, and they seem to really enjoy that experience. Well, check the uh, listings. Check the schedule to see if these games are on ESPN+, Plus because Amherst Pizza and Ale House has ESPN+, Plus, and you can uh, check out those games or the hockey games that are on ESPN+, Plus that not every bar carries uh, because they haven't uh, picked up that package. But at Amherst Pizza and Ale House, uh, they certainly do. You can watch all the college pro football games, hockey, you know, the college hoops, the college football, bowl season, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, at 55 Cross Point Parkway in Getzville. That's right off Millersport Highway in the 990. Amherst Pizza and Ale House has a fleet of TVs indoor and on the patio. I know the weather's cold out there. I keep saying it. They still they have heat out there on the patio. Uh, and, uh, well, it's supposed to be in the 60s on Saturday. So maybe you want to go watch some sports and enjoy some of uh, the last gasp of uh, warm weather that we're going to be having here. Uh, recognized by ESPN.com as Western New York's top spot to watch sports. Uh, that's Amherst Beats and Ale House. Stop in or call for takeout and delivery. 716-625-7100. Again, 716-625-7100. Amherst Beats and Ale House. Sabres play tonight and tomorrow if you're into that kind of entertainment. Home games. You'll probably get a sure. ticket if you wanted one. Yeah, I think tickets are available. Um, Jonah, anything else that we need to uh, clear uh, the docket of uh, as we uh, prepare for Tom Brady? No, I mean, we were talking about UConn, and I just wanted to mention Amari DeBerry, Williamsville South, uh, local player of the year a couple of years ago, got her first action playing for the UConn women last night, which, uh, you know, they lost to Georgia Tech. That team's going through some issues with their best player, Paige Beckers, being injured. And some other local guys, Tak Molson, Takal Molson, who's from around here. He graduated from St. Mary's, played at Canisius for two years. He hit a big winning shot for James Madison the other night. Davion Warren is starting for Texas Tech, who beat Tennessee, and he's scoring some points. He's doing pretty well out there. There's some other guys that I'm not recalling at the moment, but, you know, some good local players doing well outside of the local colleges, and sometimes that gets lost when they don't stay local. That's right. Speaking of which, how about the assistant coach uh, out at San Francisco, the Dons, the first team in the, in the oh, nation yeah, to go 10 and 0. Should mention that he's been elevated from director of basketball operations to assistant coach and they're having an excellent season. I sat next to his dad, keeping the Williamsville North book at a high school game in Niagara Falls last week. Uh, that program is doing very well and he's doing a very, well, he's doing well. I think they value him a lot. The analytics, he's responsible for a lot of that. Uh, so good job by you, Jonathan Safir. Right on. All right, Jonah. Thank you. Uh, enjoy your weekend. Um, we'll talk, uh, we'll talk Monday. I'm sure we'll talk before then, but for consumption here on Tim Graham and friends brought to you by CTBK. Yeah. Not a single cough today. I'm feeling a little better. Steroids. <laughs> Keeping me up at night, but cough's going away. Uh, Breon Harris, thank you for your concern. CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. We'll